From the Point Park University Center for Media Innovation here in downtown Pittsburgh. Hello, I'm Michael Bartley with Steeltown Entertainment. We know you remember the Real Teens popular half-hour documentary, Stand Together, Help and Hope, Breaking the Stigma of Mental Illness. Well, we're continuing that conversation here today for the next half hour or so. Teens talking to teens and our experts about breaking that hurtful stigma. And for those of you who are watching and need help now, please contact the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline or the Crisis Text Line shown below. So with that, let's begin with some perspective from our first program. We also went to Propel Brada to see how Stand Together works in schools. Come on. Anyone else? Always be true to yourself, know your worth, love yourself, and be happy. So in October, we had uh, the members from Stand Together come out and lead a two-day workshop that the students participated in. So each year, the Blackout Stigma Day is kind of like a staple at, at Braddock Hills High School. We were tossing around ideas and we were thinking, like, how can we uh, get the group engaged in a way? So we thought something that people could write on. Previous years, there was something small, but it was something similar. They actually made a web of ideas. We kind of used that as an inspiration and we thought, how about a bubble like a uh, thought bubble? Today, your crew will get an opportunity to join our thought bubble. Inside, you'll have the opportunity to share your thoughts and reflect on shared experiences by taking time to read messages that are already in the bubble. On each wall is a prompt. The prompts are open your mind, speak your mind, and ease your mind. These activities help us to be transparent with each other and it encourages us to step outside of our own bubbles and have a discussion about mental illness. During the brainstorming session, there was just this, this giant game board idea, so we kind of ran with that. So we'll start from here. There's a, there's a lot that of words people say. Actually, on our game board, we have different ways. And if it's a bad way, you, go, you have to go down the slide. And if it's a positive thing, you'll go up the ladder. I think if they just understand what stigma is, then it like just spreads awareness because they like subconsciously will probably spread it to others if they hear someone using something incorrectly. More people know about what stigma it is and like how it affects different people, who it could affect. Like whenever they did the what's good, we were watching people's answers. So like they asked them questions about stigma and then they answered it and more people know about stigma, which is a really good thing. You know, you're not so ignorant on a topic. You don't just like say things because you realize now like what people actually go through. And it's not like having a mental illness isn't necessarily a bad thing. Because if you don't, then you don't know how like, people are going through and the way if you handle it wrong, you know, it sets off triggers for some people. You go in and like you get to see like you can relate to other people's things, like some things in there you can feel like because you go through the same thing so you can kind of can relate. It's just a way to get kids to realize like everybody's brain works different. There are many ways to talk about it and you don't want to talk about it in ways that make people feel like they can't come to you. I just think this is like, like awesome. Like, it makes everybody feel comfortable to say what they want to say and not hold it in. I just think it's like a good getaway. The projects are so engaging because they're student-led. So, you know, I kind of toss it to the team. What would you be interested in? What would, what would make you want to learn? Some of them are truly inspirational. I'd say it actually is heartwarming to see some of them and actually see what people want to actually help others to actually come out more and be truly themselves. So now you know what's at stake, but how gratifying and inspiring indeed that our local teenagers know about this issue and they're doing so much about it. And our panelists here today know so much about that as well. Dr. Anna Radovic with UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, very engaged in breaking the stigma. Thanks so much for having me today. Indeed. Julius Boatwright with the agency Steel Smiling. What, what is that? So we bridge the gap, <coughs> excuse me, between community members mm -hmm. and mental health support mm -hmm. through education, advocacy, and awareness. Great. Ayala Rosenthal. Hello. 
Hello, how are you? Good, how are you? Great, thanks for being here today. Mm -hmm. You're a senior at Yeshiva School in Squirrel Hill. I am. What is going on there in terms of how you are so engaged and helping with this issue at Yeshiva? So I'm a part of the Orthodox community in Squirrel Hill. Mm -hmm. um, mental health stigma is an issue that's found everywhere in all communities, all ages. Um, but what I saw was very present was the lack of discussion and awareness specifically in my Orthodox community and specifically in teens. Um, so recently I've just been active in advocating and trying to find support and help break that stigma in my own community. Give us an example. You say it's, it's, it's so prevalent. What, what do you mean? People are afraid to come out with you know, anything, any hardship that they're going through because they're afraid that people will judge them or see them as flawed. Mm -hmm. Um, and they think that, you know, having a mental health issue is, causes them to be abnormal, you know, mm -hmm. and that's just wrong. Like you're allowed to go through, mm -hmm. you're allowed to go through rough times with your mental health and be okay. It's amazing you see that at Yeshiva. We heard that at Propel Braddock. We heard that at a lot of the local high schools and Dr. Anna, that's not at all unusual. No, it's not. Almost about a fifth of young people might have some kind of mental illness. And one thing we try to do in the healthcare setting in primary care is every adolescent should get a yearly well visit. And we try to screen for some of those problems because um, a lot of the symptoms of mental illness might not be evident to everyone. So when you're a kid, maybe you have behavioral issues, your teacher is noticing that you're acting out or your parent is kind of having a difficult time, they'll bring you in to get help. But if you have something like depression or anxiety, it could all be going on on the inside of your mind, but on the outside you look like there's no problem. And that's why, for example, there's a campaign in the United Kingdom called timetochange.org. Mm -hmm. And they talk about um, that these images of people holding their heads that are associated with all the articles you read about depression, they're really not true because people who have depression or anxiety look just like anyone else and might have a smile on their face. How concerning should it be, Julius, that um, I, I guess, I, I think this is probably accurate um, because of stigma, some of some of the kids are wearing masks, and you may need to get that mask off. In terms of because the stigma puts the mask on, they're afraid to 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 be out there and to to share with people um, what the issue is and why it's so important that they're sharing it. And that's exactly what they need to do. I think that vulnerability mm -hmm. uh, is is something that youth are actually embracing now. It's something that they're comfortable with. They're saying, you know, I'm. I'm, I'm wounded, I'm broken, and I see that, that woundedness and that brokenness in you too, and let's share it, and let's talk about it, and be open, and not be afraid to do it. So they're, they're reducing and eliminating the stigma mm -hmm. uh, themselves, which is really powerful. What, go, I'm sorry, go ahead. One thing I think is really important when we talk about youth is to think about, you know, they're not kind of living in the world by themselves. Mm -hmm. So we adults are role modeling for them what's okay and what's not okay. And although there are some parents that will bring their teens in to get help, mm -hmm. there are a lot of other parents who feel guilt and stigma themselves. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they've grown up in a world with more stigma and they're afraid about you know, what would happen to their child if mm -hmm. they you know, talk to someone about mental illness. So I think part of the change has to come from us adults and learning from some of these young people and the programs they've done in their Since schools. Since you bring that up, there, there is some change and some positive change, especially from adults. And I, all, I wonder if you feel it. There, there's an organization called Stand Together. Right. Allegheny County, they do an amazing job. They were the ones that put so much together uh, at Propel Braddock and other school districts around Allegheny County. Tell us, um, do you feel that adults care and, and, and what they're doing? So um, I've met with a lot of teens who go to public schools and who are involved with Stand Together. Sounds like mm -hmm. an amazing program, and I hope that one day we can implement it in our school. Um, I'd say that because there is a tremendous amount of stigma in my community, I don't know if I feel it as much. Teachers are starting to talk about it, but it's, we have a long way to go. I do see it though outside of my community that adults really are mm -hmm. reaching out and interested. What makes you say we have a long way to go? There's just a lot of ways we can improve. My school needs a school counselor, you know. Um, people are really struggling and they don't know who to go to. Like you said, uh, parents sometimes are also part of the stigma and they don't 
feel comfortable bringing their child to therapy or they don't want anyone to know that their child exactly. suffers from some form of depression is that right right Dr. or any I mental mean, well, that, it's, and it's hard for parents to distinguish also between symptoms of depression and then normal changes in mm -hmm. adolescence mm -hmm. too because those symptoms are happening on the inside one of the symptoms of depression is being irritable mm -hmm. sometimes that's a normal thing that can happen in mm -hmm. adolescence right, right. so it's really important for parents to have other adults be their partner in trying to figure out what's going on and not have to try to take it all on themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's where having that primary care provider or going to a teacher, talking to other adults involved mm -hmm. in that teen's life can help parents I don't know out. about your generation, but my generation, parents never wanted to admit that there was something wrong with their kid. Yeah. Am, I, am, I, am I right? Yeah, I think it, it, it's starts with education, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Having the right type of language to be able to, to describe mm -hmm. what they're feeling. And a lot of times, parents are feeling similar uh, emotions and mm -hmm. similar mental health challenges as well. So they may feel, you know, the stigma of, mm -hmm. if I say something to get support for my child, what is that gonna mean for me? Right. And, and if I'm ready to get support for myself. Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest things is the research is showing in terms of trying to prevent depression in kids. There's some mm -hmm. really good studies trying to prevent it. And if their parent is has depression, which can be more likely, and is in treatment, that child will do better. But if their parent is having a lot of trouble and symptoms, that child won't do won't do as well from that same mm -hmm. intervention. Mm -hmm. So it's important to, you know, also have a safe space for adults mm -hmm. and the whole community to get help and to get treatment and not to place blame on families who might have not had access to the right. same resources we right. have now. Yeah. Did you want to add something to that? No, that was, that was excellent. Okay, yeah. great. We, we have so much to talk about as well, and I want to get over to our social media desk. Hi, everyone. My name is Dory, and I'm here with Latasia and Gage, and this is a social media desk. Basically, what we're going to be doing here today is going on our social media accounts and relaying questions that we get from the public to our expert panel. I said that today's topic here on social media desk is mental illness and the stigma surrounding it. We were able to get out into the community and ask people all over the region about stigma. We also had the exclusive opportunity to not only talk to the county executive, Rich Fitzgerald, but Mayor Bill Peduto. Let's take a look. After learning about mental health and talking to our parents, we decided to get into the community. There's a lot of things that's out here that's being overlooked because of money or just because a lot of people just don't care about things. I think it's getting better and, and you know we're still not where we are. There's, there's still probably some folks who do uh, put a stigma around that but I think it's really an incumbent upon all of us because we know mental health issues touches all of us. Well mental health is the same as physical health yeah. and if somebody has diabetes you don't really have a preconceived conception of it. If you start to look at it and understand it as more of a brain chemistry of what's happening, just like a chemistry that would happen with your heart, then you really understand that it's simply an illness that needs to be treated and can be treated. It's enormously important, and we have an opportunity here to do it um, in Pittsburgh because we have the expertise here, we have the organizations, we have the goodwill, and we have people that are thinking about it in intelligent ways, so there's no better place to be than here to figure it out. Love the average Pittsburgher plus the mayor plus the county executive. And Dr. Runner, we, you and I, our ears sort of perked up. The mayor saying um, mental health is similar to physical health. He's right about that. Isn't yeah, he? that's yeah. right. So there are some changes that are trying to get enforced in healthcare, mm -hmm. like integrated behavioral health, mm -hmm. which means that you come to your medical provider and everything you need for your health is there, that you can get a therapist mm -hmm. there, that you can talk about your mental health and your physical health mm -hmm. in one place. And research really shows that that's the best way mm -hmm. to get people services. But um, definitely, you know, teens are growing up in a space where healthcare has, has kind of artificially divided the two mental health and physical health, and it does make the reality of getting help a little harder. For anybody who wants to answer this, how, how do we know when it's there? A lot of the time, I think it's what you don't see, you know? When it's not something that you can zoom in on and say, that's stigma. A lot of the time, it's the lack of conversation, the lack of awareness. Um, a lot, it can also be when people misuse language. Mm -hmm. So, I wanna kill myself, or, I'm so depressed because my ice cream fell, you know, things like that, like, is misusing the term. 
And I think that is also a part of stigma because it just shows people you can't be comfortable when it actually is something that you're going through. Mm -hmm. Julius? I think it's all about creating space. So giving people an opportunity to, if you hear somebody misuse mm -hmm. certain types of language, mm -hmm. acknowledging it and just educating them in that moment and not ostracizing people for, for, for doing that, but educating them. Are we, are Julius, are, are we talking openly enough? You know, when, when the Real Teens first did this program at Steeltown, um, I gotta tell you, you know, and I've been in television for 35 years, uh, it really hit a nerve. There's no question about it. Um, and, and I think sometimes we take for granted that we're talking enough about things, something as important as breaking the stigma of mental illness, particularly with adolescents and high school kids. Mm -hmm. But are we really? It, it seems like maybe we're not. I know everyone here is trying, but maybe this is for you, Dr. Anna. What more needs to be done to, to, get, to get people to talk? So I think that people need to have that that safety coming from their environment. So one thing that Stand Together was doing um, with some of the teachers were, was having like a um, sign for mm -hmm. students that I'm an okay person mm -hmm. to talk with about um, any mental health mm -hmm. issue that's going on. So creating these, like Julius was saying, safe spaces and safe environments. Mm -hmm. Or in healthcare, if we're saying, yes, this is a place where you talk about physical health, but we don't also ignore your mental health. Mm -hmm. um, and so having that language. Or media kind of bringing it mm -hmm. up yeah. as an issue. Yeah. I think those are really important. But the epicenter, the epicenter from, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, this young lady right here, mm -hmm. Ayala, from Yeshiva School in Squirrel Hill. When the teenagers talk about it, we all seem to listen. Am I right? Well, I love teenagers, so that's why I listen to my adolescent medicine right. doctor. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> but Julia, since, 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 since our program at Steel Town and the Real Teens and so forth, and Stand Together, and when it became you know, focused at the schools, when the kids started talking about it, wasn't that really the, the pinnacle of, of, of sort of this, the turnaround here? I think so, and, and I think a big piece is Every, everyone has a story, mm -hmm. right? And they start to see, we, we heard from some of the students doing the interviews, you start to see the, the commonalities and the similarities and you say, wow, I'm not the only person who's experiencing this. Like this is happening in all of my peers and uh, at different schools. And you start to feel like you can share your own story mm -hmm. because you're not, you, you, you don't have to, to remain in silence because you feel like you're the only person going through it. Interesting. So that's kind of a neat thing that Ayala has been a part of. Um, I have an intervention that's a website called SOVA or mm -hmm. sova.pit.edu. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we have stories every day that are articles about things like having stigma and negative health beliefs. Mm -hmm. But the most impactful stories are people who are writing their own blog posts mm -hmm. and young people writing about their own experiences like what did it feel like when I thought I needed an antidepressant? Mm -hmm. What did that say about me? And mm -hmm. how did I deal with those feelings? Mm -hmm. What more do you need in terms of help in accomplishing what you need to accomplish with breaking the stigma? I would have to think about it for a little bit, but I think in general, really having the right resources where the teens are found. So mm -hmm. school, um, you know, social events, things like that where if, so, if somebody needs something related to mental health, they have it. Mm -hmm. I also think, like Dr. Anna was saying, if you know, we have physical checkups mm -hmm. in school every year, if we did have a survey or something once a year that we, everybody was required to do, that would definitely be breaking stigma and right. also giving proper awareness. There's Great. actually some policy makers interested in doing things like that. Mm -hmm. you know? Indeed, yeah. Okay, well, speaking of resources, I wanna take a moment to let you know that if you are looking for additional information, don't forget about this resource about mental illness and stigma. Go to leadpittsburgh.org. Again, leadpittsburgh.org. Don't forget about that local organization. They do extraordinary work. So with that, let's go back to the media desk. Hey guys, welcome back to the social media desk. It looks like we got our first question through email. The email is stating that they love everything that they are hearing in this discussion and that has inspired them to be more confident in combating their mental illness. However, they would like to know more about resources available to them and where they can go to seek help. 
And go ahead, Dr. Rana. Yeah, so definitely a good place to start is your primary care provider. Mm -hmm. So all um, pediatricians and family practice providers mm -hmm. can see adolescents for regular mm -hmm. well checkups. Mm -hmm. And one thing is, at least in state of Pennsylvania, but other states, mm -hmm. is that teen's confidentiality is protected. Right. So if there's something that you tell a provider that is life-threatening, then they have to share that with supportive adults mm -hmm. who take care of you. But if it's something like, you know, I'm thinking about self-harm, but sure. I'm not sure, you know, those are th things that the law actually protects teens. So a provider, a healthcare provider is a really good place to go. Any, anything to add before we go back to the social media? Desk? I would say to start within the space that you're in. Mm -hmm. Start with your peers and, mm -hmm. and being comfortable with sharing your story. And once you do that, then that'll help you get connected to the right resources. Okay, great. Yeah, okay, was, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say something similar. I make sure to always have an adult that mm -hmm. I know I can ask questions, mental health related. Sometimes a friend might text me like, I'm thinking of suicide and that's yeah. really intense and I can't necessarily deal with that on my own so I pass it on to an expert that I'm mm -hmm. in close contact with. Can I ask, go ahead, uh, can I ask you one quick question? Sure. Um, and, and this is, I'm, I'm not, it's not, specific yeah. to yeshiva yeah. it's to everything um when you when you got involved and remember dr Anna, the the, the older dice kids um they had a l t most uh, tons of support mm -hmm. but there were some questions from the adults when you got involved with the teenage groups to cut the stigma did you have any um uh, did you have any resistance from adults or teens? adults adults no, but okay. I've had one Good. challenge with one okay. adult who didn't really believe uh -huh. in what I was saying, uh -huh. and she was like, can I speak to an adult? And I was like, okay, uh -huh. but they don't know what, you know, this is coming from my passion, um, but principals, teachers are so supportive and very interested. It's mostly the resources that's holding back from the proper support. That's excellent to know, excellent to know. Okay, back to the social media desk. Latasia has a question for us. This next one is coming in from Winchester the most misleading statements about mental health? I would say that, that people don't want support. Um, we, we do a lot of uh, outreach on the streets and in schools, and everyone is saying we want the resources. Uh -huh. it's, it's just a matter of being able to, to feel comfortable and know where to go to find them. But mm -hmm. everybody, mostly everyone, wants support. Any um, misleading statements? Any Anything come to your mind? Um, just that the the way that it, it's it's talked about in terms of uh, symptoms of depression and anxiety mm -hmm. there's a lot of um, talk in kind of the community about you know I'm feeling down I'm feeling depressed and there's a whole like range of how you can feel so everyone kind of has felt some of these things before but whether or not it's enough of a problem that mm -hmm. you need mm -hmm. treatment so there's um, ways that people talk about mental illness as if everybody has one, so kind of downplay how bad it is for some people, sure, sure. and then that can be kind of difficult. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's important not to diagnose yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's go back to the social media desk. Doria has got something. We're beginning to get a lot of questions in from all over. Uh, this one specifically from Washington, D.C. says, can you ask about counseling? If there's a stigma around it, do the teens openly discuss it with their friends, and how has it helped them? Openly discussing it with their friends. Well, why don't you go ahead. Sure. I, go ahead, sure. Um, I, can, I can say from personal experience, mm -hmm. it takes a while to open up about counseling and therapy, and at this point in my life, my, pretty much my whole high school is aware that every Wednesday morning, I'm at a, ther I'm at a therapist, and it's totally open, and it's almost... Everybody kind of like chimes in like, oh, mine is like next Monday. And it's actually really comforting to like know you're going through something, I'm going through something, and that's okay. For some people, though, they don't want to be as open with it. They like prefer it to be more quiet and private, and that's okay. But I think that it's definitely, um, it's definitely like supportive when you open up. You're, you like get support when you open up about the help that you're getting. Great. Anything to add on that? Dr. Anna. <laughs> well, so it really depends on your um, environment and mm -hmm. your community. Mm -hmm. So if you're within a supportive environment already, mm -hmm. then you might feel more safe to open up. If you're in a more, you know, underprivileged scenario or you're more, more vulnerable mm -hmm. to kind of 
people who don't understand mental illness mm -hmm. around you or um, maybe you're disadvantaged for other reasons, then it can be less comfortable to open up. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, people who have autism and go online to find mm -hmm. support communities, mm -hmm. they can find a lot of online support but they're also more likely to get bullied because the type of social interactions they have are more awkward for other people who don't have some of those social disadvantages. Mm -hmm. And so there's two sides of this story. So mm -hmm. it can really help to open up to other people, but you have to be aware of who those people are, what kind of environment, and are you in a safe environment to do that? Okay, back to the social media desk. We're gonna get as many questions in as we can. Latasia. If a student um, is worried about seeking help and afraid to tell somebody. So one really awesome resource is Crisis Text Line mm -hmm. that you mentioned earlier because um, Crisis Text Line is totally anonymous. You don't have to be in a crisis like that you're thinking about going to the emergency mm -hmm. room or calling the police, um, but you can talk to somebody who knows about these types of issues and get some useful advice, even if you feel like there's nobody you can talk to. Mm -hmm. So it's always okay to reach out to a crisis resource and it can be completely anonymous. There are sometimes young people, they would share it with their friends, but I don't know. I mean, I don't think it's like you need to share it with your friends. If you're an open person, I would say it's definitely helpful. Um, the only downside to that is sometimes people who aren't educated in mm -hmm. mental health or aware can tend to distance themselves or um, back away from their friends, which is definitely mm -hmm. not the way you want to go. So, gotcha. but I liked what you said before, that it doesn't have to be your parent. You know, if you have a supportive adult in your life, just that they have some of that life experience, mm -hmm. know some of the sure. resources, um, they're probably more likely to be able to help you than your friend just because of age and experience. Also, yeah. even if it's not about yourself, if you know somebody that's really yeah. struggling. I recently had a friend who was saying really troubling things and I didn't know if it was an emergency situation. And so I texted this person that I have, he's an expert in the mental health field and immediately within seconds sent me the crisis hotline and told me an address to go to. And mm -hmm. you know, so these people are really helpful. Talk about appointments and so forth. Let's go back to the social media desk. Latasia has something on that, Latasia. Nervous to go see a counselor. Now, we, we hear that before, don't we? I'm going to have to ask you to pick up on that. Yeah, so what's interesting is, for example, if you have symptoms of anxiety, that makes you worry sometimes about mm -hmm. interacting with somebody face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. um, so you might be kind of having a lot of worried thoughts about, wow, this is so embarrassing. Like, what is this person going to think of me? Mm -hmm. And all of those kind of things. One thing that can help sometimes is easing into that situation. Um, so some practices, you'll be able to do a warm referral where your provider can introduce you to that therapist. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you could set up a phone call the first time. Maybe you could bring a support person with you to that first visit. It doesn't have to be kind of bam. But then understanding that that person realizes that you're coming to them and that you are going to be nervous mm -hmm. about that first visit right, and right. they're completely used to that, um, that, you know, those types of things might help a little bit. But, the, but they have a responsibility, the counselor, to be reassuring. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and sure. that first visit is really just about kind of setting the stage for mm -hmm. what to expect. And one important thing for you to know if you are seeing a counselor it, or a mental health therapist mm -hmm. is that you should have goals for that visit and mm -hmm. you should be able to let them know what you need or what you want or if it's not working out. Mm -hmm. So we're not really afraid to tell a medication, hey medication, you're not working for me, I'm right, gonna right, not right. use you anymore. Um, and so therapists know that sometimes things are not working out or they have to make some adjustments. Mm -hmm. um, so don't feel afraid to tell them what you need. Anything to add anybody? I would just say that almost all therapists that I have, from experience, almost all of them have a really comfortable chair. Okay. So that's definitely like a plus. You don't have to be worried about comfort. You know, they offer you like a drink. So mm -hmm. it's very welcoming. Great. Okay. Back to the social media desk. The next question coming in says, 
Who should I go to for help about my mental health when I'm feeling like I may need to talk to someone? I want to talk to somebody, but I don't know how to start. Don't know exactly where to start. Julius. I think there's, there are a lot of peer support mm -hmm. groups within the community. Um, starting with, with your teachers or going to the counselor within your school or even asking your parents mm -hmm. about where some of those peer support groups are because those are more informal and it can help you get more comfortable so you can ease into actual counseling or therapy. But I, I would recommend starting with support groups. Mm -hmm. okay. Anything to add, anybody? Yeah, and I mean, just like I've been saying, you know, going to your primary care provider. So if you have a sore throat, you're going to go to them and say, do I have strep? You know, so if you have some of these symptoms and you're like, I'm not really sure this is a thing or not, um, you can go to them and get some advice from somebody who has seen a lot of different people with those same types of problems and given advice to a lot of people. And it can be completely confidential because sure. that's your right. Okay. Yeah. All right, back to the social media desk now. Let's uh, go to Doria. Now this last question is coming in from downtown. It says, how can we get more youth involved in talking about mental health and what is the difference between mental illness and daily struggles? I think when, when something starts to impact your ability to go to school mm -hmm. and to uh, interact with other people in a way that's productive, then you may want to, to take some time to really think about, is this, uh, do I have an actual diagnosis mm -hmm. or do I need to go see an actual professional? Yeah, there's a really great website from Mental Health America mm -hmm. that actually has a lot of the screening tools to a ask you some of the questions and see, you know, is what I'm going through fitting with the mental health diagnosis. And then when you get kind of the answers, mm -hmm. you can take that to somebody like a provider. Mm -hmm. But another thing to know that, you know, Julius is focusing on the functioning, which is part of every mental illness. Like if you have so many symptoms that you're not able to function and live the life you want to be living, that's important. But there are some people who are high functioning but they're dealing with so much struggle internally that every day, like it's really affecting their lives and, mm -hmm. and they're having this kind of, you know, um, emotional struggle inside mm -hmm. where, where it's really bothering them, those symptoms, that can also mean that it's a mental illness. So mm -hmm. just because somebody, um, you know, is doing really well in school and getting all A's, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not having trouble. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I would also say if you're a teen who is passionate about advocating on mental health or supporting their peers, talk about it. Start the conversation. That's the first move. Get people to really hear what you're trying to say and people are willing to listen. Once you open the conversation, people hear you and people want to hear more and you know, once you make the opening, people are really accepting of it and I think it's really important as youth and as teens, we really do have a powerful voice. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Any last thoughts from any of you before we um, go into a little uh, a very important message break? Any, any, any last thoughts? Did we miss anything in this, in this conversation? We, there was a lot of stuff to cover. And, and don't forget that you know, we, we mentioned those websites to go to, the resources. It's really important to go back to those and continually go back to those. If you're a teenager, if you're a parent, and, and you're, you're engaged in this issue of, of stigma and, and being victimized by it. One, one thing that's important for teens, because you know, you haven't been on the earth as long, mm -hmm, right. <laughs> sometimes you don't realize what you're stepping into. Mm -hmm. So there's like a whole history of why mental health stigma has been an issue mm -hmm. um, and why it as kind of a disability has been a dis disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think right now what's really neat is, you know, people are trying to talk about it and be more open-minded, but you are kind of stepping into this really difficult problem. Mm -hmm. And so for me doing research in mental health, sometimes I get frustrated, like, why can't I make a, a more of a difference or why do I keep running into these hurdles? But then if I step back and look at how big of a problem is, like how many different pieces there are, mm -hmm. then I get some perspective like that this is a tough road to take. Right. So um, sometimes it's awesome how much energy teens have at the same time, like give yourself some credit for trying to sure. deal with a really tough issue that a lot of people haven't been able to fix. Julius Boatwright. I would say that we're, we're all dealing with something, right? So it starts with, with us. So how are we talking to people? How are we giving people the room to express themselves? 
how are we approaching people when we're having just everyday conversations with them? Because the chances are everyone is dealing with something at some point in time in their lives. And if we give them the room and the freedom to feel like they can comfortably express that, mm -hmm. then that could be the first step to helping them on their process. Right. I was going to say something similar that you really aren't alone. And although it may seem like that, or um, you could be experiencing isolation and feel like nobody cares, but people really do care and people are here to help you know support you and there is there are resources and there are people out there that you know can help you with your feelings and mm -hmm. yeah you're not alone there it is that's the bottom line right there you're not alone thank you all for this mm -hmm. critical important information this was an unbelievable discussion in closing we want to thank you and we want to thank all of our participating schools for joining us today thanks to our terrific expert panelist dr anna radovic Julius Boatwright, Ayala Rosenthal, you were terrific, <laughs> believe it. And a big thanks to Point Park Center for Media Innovation and everyone at Steel Town who has made this happen. We also want to take a moment to thank our terrific sponsor, Staunton Farm Foundation, Lead Pittsburgh, the Joella P. Bain Trust, SOVA, the Fine Foundation, Jewish Healthcare Foundation, the McGuinn Family Foundation. You truly took the lead on this. Thanks, and let's continue to work to break the stigma of mental illness. I'm Michael Bartley at Steeltown. Thanks so much for watching.